And welcome to Down Home Virginia. I'm Sherry McKinney. And I'm Norm Hyde. Coming up this month on Down Home Virginia. Superfoods are making a big impact on consumers and many Virginia farmers. Chef Maxwell has a recipe for spaghetti with clams and Virginia corn. And the cows came to town for the National Holstein Convention in Richmond. Welcome back to Down Home Virginia, everyone. We're coming to you this month from the campus of Virginia State University in Chesterfield County, one of two agricultural colleges in Virginia. That's right. Here at VSU, agricultural researchers have been working for years to find new markets for small farmers in the Old Dominion, especially niche markets. One of the things that researchers are doing here at Virginia State University is encouraging producers to grow superfoods. Those are foods that are rich in nutrients. The term superfoods was coined in the 1960s and was the name given for the great number of beneficial nutrients certain foods contain. Virginia State University Extension Specialist Teresa Nartia says she has noticed that the interest in such products has clearly risen in recent years. If you simplify it, it's just um, moms, families, people looking for food to be healthy to be less processed. While there are beneficial aspects of superfoods imported from abroad, many consumers look for locally grown and why not? Virginia producers grow plenty of the foods that are considered superfoods, including beans, broccoli, sweet potatoes, squash, pumpkins, and dark berries like raspberries and one of the most renowned domestic superfoods, the blueberry. Blueberries are very rich in beneficial nutrients. Research has linked the blueberries, particularly with the prevention of cardiovascular diseases. They've also been claims that the berry could prevent age-related diseases such as dementia and Alzheimer's. Blueberries lead the pack because they are among the best source of antioxidants and are widely available. Lewis Woodall and his family have been growing blueberries on their Craig County farm for 21 years. More than 1,200 plants are grown here and business has never been better. Our best year we had, uh, which is 2006 I believe, we had the uh, 16, a little over 1,600 gallons sold. Wow. And we're having a good year this year. Uh, we've been open, let's see, today, we've been open nine days today and we sold almost 900 gallons. Well, I think it's like, it, say, the antioxidants uh, value of it, you know, the, the, you know, eliminate the free radicals. And, and uh, I think that's the main thing, you know, people read about it like that and they, want to come and get it. And a lot, a lot of people just pick a whole bunch and freeze them, you know. That's the way we do. We put up about 30 gallons a year. Nartia believes more producers could take Woodall's lead and branch out into superfoods production. What I'm finding just from an agribusiness standpoint is that farmers can get in on this, um, this uh, societal movement for healthy food and that producers need to understand the, what's driving it. So what's the easiest way to include superfoods into your diet? Researchers say to fill your plate with color, red, orange, purple, and blue. To find a grower near you, go to saveourfood.org and look for our fresh food locator. While it's home to the Agriculture Research Farm at Virginia State University, Chesterfield County Agriculture also has an economic impact in the metropolitan Richmond area. There are 220 farms in Chesterfield County with 5,183 acres of harvested cropland. The major crops are soybeans, wheat, and hay, along with 1,600 beef cattle. Like other suburban areas near a city, there's also a thriving fresh produce sector. Altogether, agriculture generates almost four and a half million dollars in cash receipts for Chesterfield County farmers. Superfoods may be a growing trend for small producers, but how can a consumer incorporate them into their daily meals? Candace Johnson reports it's not as difficult as you might think. Adding garden fresh produce to a daily meal is one of the many ways experts say you can be healthier and help your diet. Virginia State University held a superfoods demonstration where chefs from around the state competed for a cash prize and show how superfoods can be easily added to recipes. Winning chef Todd Johnson of Richmond used numerous nutrient-dense foods from Central Virginia farms for his award-winning dish. I did a uh, escabeche, is a uh, Spanish style ceviche, but it's poached shrimp. And again, I used all the wonderful produce out there. I had watermelon, uh, canary melon, onions, tomatoes, tomatillos, 
uh, habaneros, jalapenos. So it was just a wonderful, um, wonderful garden out there. And as well as I made the fig jam for the empanadas um, that were right out there off the tree as well. Author and dietitian Tanya Reinhardt explained to the participants why superfoods are a good marketing and consumer niche and how they can be gradually added to each meal. Maybe start with, I'm going to have one superfood that I've never tried before a day. Um, and then build up. Say, I'm going to have, I don't know, you know, 10 in a week. Um, so just kind of incorporating them into your routine. Both Johnson and Reinhardt agree that if you want to add superfoods to your diet, the growing local foods movement has made it easier than ever to do so. Reporting from Chesterfield County, Virginia, I'm Candace Johnson. Virginia farmers do a great job reaching out to their consumers and recently there were hundreds of Virginia food specialty items that were featured as part of the nation's largest food trade show in Washington, D.C. The Summer Fancy Food Show moved from New York City to Washington, D.C. this year, and Virginia had the largest number of exhibitors at 52. Each year, chefs and buyers meet up with manufacturers and even small farmers to taste and test beverages, baby foods, candies, cookies, jellies, and more. Every type of specialty food are featured. 180,000 products from 80 different countries were at the show, the largest on the East Coast. The exhibitors have really enjoyed it. Uh, it's been a lot of new traffic. I think about 60% of the visitors, uh, buyers here at the show, it's their first time attending a, uh, the fancy food show. So it's been a great show for our companies. Green says there were $63 billion worth of specialty food products sold in the U.S. in 2009, and sales figures are growing this year. With the show scheduled to return to Washington next year, he is urging even more Virginia farm businesses to take advantage of this opportunity to market their products. Up next on Down Home Virginia, clams and corn and spaghetti, a tasty summertime treat just ahead from Chef Maxwell's Kitchen. I'm Mark Viette. Coming up on Down Home Virginia, we're going to talk about great ground covers for the shade. Stay with us. Blueberries are a small fruit crop that can be grown successfully in most areas of Virginia. Interest in this small berry is blooming as consumers discover its flavor and uses as a fresh fruit or in baked goods. The berries are high in antioxidants and vitamins. They also have a long post-harvest shelf life as compared to other small fruit and freeze well for future use. The number of blueberry farms in Virginia is growing in response to this demand. There are 220 blueberry farms and 256 acres of berries grown in the Old Dominion. Nationwide blueberry production totaled $589.9 million in 2010. I grew this apple on my family farm. I harvested this apple with my own two hands. I transported this apple to market. I purchased this apple for my store. I bought this apple for my family. And I protected this apple, the farm it grew on, and everyone who touched it by joining Save Our Food. Help Virginia Farm Bureau protect farms and families by joining Save Our Food. Sign up today at SaveOurFood.org. I love this apple. Hi, welcome to Chef Maxwell's Kitchen. We're down here in Norfolk, Virginia, where the seafood is wonderful. We're at the, the Culinary Institute of Virginia, where tomorrow's chefs are being trained today. We're here to play with Virginia food, and we've got some great stuff for you today. We've got fresh produce that you can get from your farmer's market, got wonderful sweet corn, got some fresh basil, some fresh parsley and thyme, we've got good sweet onions, and we've got aquacultured clams. And we're going to be playing with this and this pasta. This is a whole wheat pasta, so this dish, generally speaking, is very good for you. I'm going to add a little bit of olive oil to this. If you let it get too hot, it changes its, text, its uh, aroma and flavor, and I'm not excited by it, but this recipe works best with olive oil. So, right, it's about hot. I'm going to add some garlic. You see how quick that started to sing to us? Some garlic. You can never have too much garlic, especially these days with all those vampire movies out. All right. So we've got that. I'm going to throw some onions in here and stir this around. It's going to take a couple of minutes to cook. We want it to kind of brown. All right. I'm going to throw some fresh thyme in there. I'm just pulling the, the leaves off. 
leaving the stems behind. I'm going to chop this up. Now I can't wait till the technology is there so you can share the aroma with me. We're not quite there yet, but this is delightful. Onions, garlic, fresh thyme, wonderful. Okay, while that's cooking, we're going to get our corn together. I've got some of it done here. All I'm doing is cutting it off the cob. Just go straight down, turn it, go straight down. What we want to do is try and bring the sugars out of the onions. I know it doesn't sound, it seem like intuitively that there's a lot of sugar in onions, but there is. There's a good amount of sugar in there, and, we, and the heat will help bring it out. And once it starts to come out, it'll start to brown. You can see down here it's starting to get some color down there. And we're going to throw the, throw the corn in. Now we don't want to cover this now because if we cover it, it'll sweat the water out and the temperature will drop down to 212, which is where water boils. So as, if you cover it, the water stays in and the temperature stays down. You leave it uncovered, the water goes away, and you can get it up to the 300, 350 degrees you need for caramelization. Okay, we've got this colored the way we want it. I'm going to sprinkle a little bit of flour in here. Now what we're making is called a roux, and a roux is equal weights of flour and fat. And we're taking the olive oil as our fat, and we're taking the flour and sprinkling it in here and moving it around. Now it needs to be cooked a little bit to get that floury taste out of it. What's going to happen then is when we add more liquids to this pan, it's going to make its own sauce. Now that it's all incorporated, cooked down a little bit, we're going to add some white wine. And this is a Pinot Grigio I'm using here, but you can use any dry white wine. Or if you don't want to use wine, you can use grape juice or you could use apple juice. Right. Either one goes really good with clam. So I'm adding a cup or two of, of the wine. Now we don't have to worry about alcohol, because alcohol evaporates at 170 degrees. And we're cooking this now at over 250. So by the time it gets finished, there'll be no alcohol in this dish. We'll just be left with the flavor and the aroma of the wine. All right. Now I'm going to take a little bit of basil. All right, I'm going to sh chiffonade this, cut it into little strips. We've talked about chiffonade before on the show. All right, and that's going to go in. Right, we're going to take a little bit of parsley. This is flat leaf Italian parsley. Don't get it confused with cilantro. Cilantro has a very big flavor. Parsley is very mild, but it gives a little garden sweetness to the dish. Mm -hmm. I'm going to chop that up. Put that in there. And Mm, mm, mm. This is starting to get really an aroma I love. Okay, now we're going to take the clams, and I've washed these good. You've got to make sure you wash the clams good. All right. Scrub the outside. Use a little brush if you need to. All right. Putting them up is a habit. It's not required, but it is a habit that I got into a long time ago that makes sure that the clam stays in the shell. Right. Okay, that should be pretty close to enough. You don't want to jam them in too much, otherwise they won't open effectively. So now we're going to cover this, and in about five minutes the clams will open, and all the juice from the clam will go down and make our sauce. All right, these should be just about ready. Now we're going to open up this pot, and oh goodness, yes. Look at these. I'm going to start pulling these out, all right, so that we can get the pasta in. It's still popping open. I'm going to pull some of the finished ones out. I'm going to add the pasta. In that goes. Move 
this over closer. that there, throw some clams in on top of this, alright guys, stop drooling, I'm going to sprinkle it with a little bit of green onions, right, and here we've got clams from the Chesapeake with herbs and vegetables from Virginia. Wonderful dish. Tasty, it's good for you, and best of all, it's all Virginia food. For more delicious recipes using Virginia grown fruits and vegetables, contact Lisa Lloyd at the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services at 102 Governor Street, Richmond, Virginia, 23219. Chef Maxwell's recipes are listed on the Save Our Food website at saveourfood.org. Many of us have a hard time growing plants in the shade. And the reason is, as you see here, I'm surrounded by trees. The trees take all the moisture out of the ground. So we really want to grow plants that can deal with that environment, like the Solomon seal, like hostas, like ferns, or the hardy begonia. The other thing I like to do in my shade gardens is to plant plants, as you see here, in large groups. It just looks nicer when you have less variety and solid groups that we have right around us. Let's take a look at some of these plants that will grow in the shade. The Japanese Solomon seal here carpets the ground and you know it doesn't take a lot of plants. Just a few plants and over a couple years it spreads like you see here. And right in front of me one of my favorite hostas. This is hosta sum in substance and the leaves are tremendous and huge, and that is just one plant. So it covers an area that's almost six, six and a half feet in diameter. And right here, another easy to grow plant is the hardy begonia. And that is a plant that will either reseed itself or it's a plant that produces, uh, it's like aerial potatoes in the leaves late in the season. They drop to the ground and they come back in the warmer climates year after year. Great ground cover plant that'll be blooming in about three weeks. But again, large masses really is soothing on the eyes and it's also soothing on your mind. Remember, there are certain trees that you're gonna have a hard time growing under no matter what. That'll be like the silver maple. But here I'm underneath the beautiful large leaved magnolia, which is just neat, just, you know, because of the size of the leaves. And then right here, the uh, beautiful um, Quercifolia hydrangea. And then right below me is another layer, and that is the Japanese painted fern to really brighten up your garden. And again, planted in large groups and large masses, and uh, it's bright and showy. Another reason to use ground covers in the shade is to prevent runoff. They also help the roots to filter the water, and it does prevent erosion problems. So you can use things like you see here, hosta. This is hosta knockout that's nice and bright in that sort of uh, shadier area in a garden. And then you've got hosta blue angel right here in front of me. In addition to using ground cover plants, you're gonna to wanna to mulch your garden to conserve moisture. It also keeps the soils cooler. And here they've used pine needles very effectively. It's my favorite mulch. And you don't need but maybe two to three inches. It allows the water to go through without running off. And it also conserves the drying out of your soils. I'm Mark Viette, join me next time in the garden. For more garden tips, go to inthegardenradio.com. Up next on Down Home Virginia, we'll see how the Richmond Convention Center became a dairy cattle barn. Stay with us. Hundreds of expensive dairy cows visited downtown Richmond last month, along with dairy farmers from all across the country. The National Holstein Convention was a chance to celebrate one of the state's largest farm industries. 
Dairy farming is big business in Virginia. $266 million worth of milk was sold in 2009, and the dairy industry is the third largest sector in the state's farm economy. So it's no surprise that fellow dairy farmers from across the country were eager to visit the Old Dominion this summer. As farmhands moved the animals and milk the classic black and white dairy cows, it was hard to realize how much money was represented by them. Christopher Potts of Loudoun County says some of the animals would fetch as much as $100,000 at auction. His family dairy has specialized in purebred Holsteins for 30 years. Raising and selling top quality cows allows them to earn more than just what they get from selling milk. I've done it since I was probably for the last 10 years. I've sold, well, I've uh, probably 10 animals. A lot of that money's gone to finance my own college education, and that's been a big help. But the convention was more than just a national cattle auction. It was also a chance for Virginia dairy farmers to show off their industry, which has about 95,000 dairy cows on 715 licensed farms. Visits to dairy farms like this one in Goochland County were part of the trip for many convention goers, including fourth generation dairyman Todd Jones of Indiana. You guys are a little warmer climate, I think. You know, we are a little more enclosed. Uh, this is actually only the second farm I've been to since I've been here. Uh, but it's, it's a little bigger, a little more open. You don't have to have quite the winter protection, I guess. Jones and other farmers stressed that while dairy farms may have gotten larger in recent years, the vast majority are still family-run operations, not corporate farms. Jones is hoping his children will be the fifth generation to run their dairy farm in Indiana, and Potts plans to take over his Virginia family farm someday. It's just like any other job that, you know, you don't want to go to work hating your job every day especially with dairy farm because you work a lot more than a 40 hour week and you won't be motivated to wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning if you don't like doing it. And it's passion like his that assures the dairy industry still has a bright future in the Old Dominion. Sherry, one of the really neat things about that story was all the young people that were involved in the dairy industry. I know, it's really quite inspiring to see their interest in a career that isn't exactly easy. It's something to look forward to in our new generations. And that's going to do it for this month on Down Home Virginia. Coming up next month, we're going to tell you about an effort to improve private property rights in the Old Dominion. And of course, we take you to an antique tractor show. It is just one of hundreds of ways that we celebrate rural heritage here in Virginia. So for everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching. Make it a good month. Chesapeake Bay Atlantic Appalachia Home in my heart always You know I'll make my home in Virginia I grew this apple on my family farm. I harvested this apple with my own two hands. I transported this apple to market. I purchased this apple for my store. I bought this apple for my family. And I protected this apple, the farm it grew on, and everyone who touched it by joining Save Our Food. Help Virginia Farm Bureau protect farms and families by joining Save Our Food. Sign up today at saveourfood.org. I love this apple.